say, say, we welcome, we welcome you. We welcome you. We welcome you.
Good morning, Bridge Nation. Good morning to all our online viewers. Let me just take this opportunity to wish everyone a happy New Year's. God is good and worthy of all our praise. Let us pray. Most gracious and eternal Father, in the precious name of Jesus, Lord, we just want to pause and say thank you. Thank you for another day that you have made, Heavenly Father. And we said we ought to rejoice and be glad in it. We enter to worship and we depart to serve. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for your wonderful Son, Jesus the Christ, who died for the remission of our sins. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the redemptive work that he did on the cross for us, so that we might have a chance in life and have it more abundantly. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for if it had not been for him on our side, where would we be? We thank you for being our God, our Abba, our Father, which art in heaven, and above you there is no other Lord. Thank you for all that you've done and all that you're doing and all that you will continue to do. In the mighty matchless name of Jesus. Thank you for the new mercies, Lord, that you show us every day. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for blessing us, Heavenly Father, for keeping us, Lord, for hiding us underneath your pavilion and sheltering us from the storm. Even though we're in the midst of a pandemic, Heavenly Father, we are still opening up the windows of heaven and pouring out such blessings upon us that the shall of the moon of the sea. If I had a thousand tongues, Heavenly Father, I'd praise you with every single one of them. I want to thank you, Heavenly Father, for our pastor, the Reverend Tisha Williams, Lord. Thank you for her vision, Heavenly Father. Thank you for her ingenuity, Heavenly Father, her wisdom, Heavenly Father. Continue to bless her, continue to keep her, Lord. Hold her in the palm of your mighty hands. Continue to bless her husband, Deacon Larry Williams, Lord. Continue to allow your spirit to fall afresh on her, Lord. And bless our ministries, Heavenly Father, here at First Baptist Church of Bridgehampton. Bless each and every one of us, individually and collectively, Lord. As we continue to march up the King's Highway and give your name the praise, the glory, and the honor. I ask a special blessing this morning, Heavenly Father, for Mr. Dixon. Continue to heal his body in the name of Jesus, Lord. I know you can heal him, Lord. You did it before, and I know you can do it again. You can do it exceedingly and abundantly above all we can ever ask. For you are God of omnipotence, a God of omnipresence, and a God of omnipotence. All wise, all moon, all spirit, all love, and all power. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for all that you have done and all that you're doing and all that you will continue to do. In the mighty name of Jesus, Lord, forgive us for our sins and our transgressions. If there's anything in our hearts or in our minds that you are kind to us doing your work, I ask that you will make it in the mighty name of Jesus. Continue to keep us, Lord. Bless our children, Lord. Bless our seniors, Lord. Bless those, Heavenly Father, that don't even know you even know the part of this. Bless those who are going through the garden of this thing, Lord. Comfort their hearts as well as you can. Let them know that weeping may be real for you. The joy comes in us. You are the joy of this strength and the joy of this power. So bless us, Heavenly Father. Continue to bless those that are in the sound of my voice. Meet every need. You know who they are and where they are. And we'll be so careful to give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. It is in the name of the Son of Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Lord. Amen. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed.
not satisfied and we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. get here. Now were those who said that we would get here only over their dead bodies. Well, yes, sir. Talk, talk. Yes. All the world today knows that we are here and we are standing before the forces of power in the state of Alabama saying we ain't gonna let nobody turn us around. <laughs> your lot to be a street sweeper. Set out to sweep streets like Michelangelo painted pictures. If you can't be a pine on the top of the hill, be a scrub in the valley, but be the best little scrub on the side of the reel. Who doesn't love a good speech? In fact, much of what we know of our nation's history is learned from a memorable speech. You may not have been born when John F. Kennedy was elected president, but no doubt you've heard these famous words from his inauguration speech. Ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Or even perhaps you don't remember a time when Germany was divided by East and West by the Berlin Wall. But one can never forget the passion in then President Reagan's voice as he commanded Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Or even in more recent years, the speech that made a president when Barack Hussein Obama, the skinny kid with a funny name, took the stage of the 2004 Democratic National Convention and reminded us that it is not a black America and a white America and Latino America and Asian America. There is the United States of America. And while this last speech has nothing to do with our American history as a movie buff, I must give an honorable mention to Jack Nicholson in the 1992 film A Few Good Men when in response to Tom Cruise's hostile questioning, he proclaims, you can't handle the truth. How many of you remember that epic speech? Oh, but truly, there's no way to acknowledge speeches that shaped our history without including the speeches of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr hailed as one of the greatest orators to have ever lived. Speakers, teachers, and especially preachers pour over his works in hopes of capturing for themselves even an ounce of the expertise and charisma that he had to craft the perfect sermon or speech. It was his ability to connect with an audience of two or 250,000 that was incomparable. His willingness to share from his own personal experiences tugged at the heartstrings of the hearer and spurred people into action. He had a talent for transforming words into paintbrushes to create illustrative masterpieces in the minds of the audience. Oh, and we cannot forget that voice, that, that booming voice, the rise and fall of his cadence, slow and steadied in the reading of scripture, light and casual to deliver a Bob Hope joke or to the boom of his Baptist preacher, inspiring us all to dream. Oh yes, when it came to oratory, Dr. King is arguably the best speaker that ever lived. In fact, I wanna to talk to you today 
about one of Dr. King's most important speeches. I'm not referring to 1957's Give Us the Ballot, We Will Transform the South. I'm not referring to 1961's If the Negro Wins, Labor Wins. I'm certainly not referring to 1965's Our God is Marching On in response to that bloody Sunday in Selma. I'm not referring to 1967's A Time to Break Silent, a pivotal moment when King openly expressed his disapproval of America's participation in the Vietnam War. I am not even referring to the hauntingly prophetic speech delivered on the eve of his death when he takes us on a journey to the mountain and the assurance of a promised land. No, nope. the speech to which I refer was not televised. Excerpts were not included in daily headlines. Reporters did not rush to the scene in hopes of a byline. It was not delivered from the Capitol steps or a prestigious pulpit, quite the opposite in fact. In his book on Dr. King, titled May Not Get There With You, Dr. Michael Eric Dyson tells of Dr. King's 1968 swing through rural poor parts of the Black South, drumming up support for his Poor People's March on Washington, D.C. And during his visit, King is captivated by a poor woman in church who shares, as Dyson describes, a tale of Mississippi's material misery. She says, people just don't know, but it's really hard. This poor woman in church pleads, not only me, there's so many more that's in the same shape. I'm not the only one. It's just so many right around the corner that don't have shoes, clothes, is naked and hungry. Part of the time you have to fix your children pinto beans, morning, dinner, and supper. They don't know what it is to get a good meal. And King, visibly moved, offers this. You all are really to be admired. And I want you to know that you have my moral support. I'm going to be praying for you. I'm going to be coming back to see you. And we are going to be demanding when we go to Washington that something be done and done immediately about these conditions. This, my brothers and sisters, is the speech that I submit to you today. It's not the speech that children are performing in schools and churches across America, such as I have a dream. And yet, it may have been King's greatest speech ever, because this speech is the easiest to adopt as our pattern of speech. What do I mean? So you may never have occasion to recite, I have a dream. And most of us can't recall one word from the drum major instinct. And I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say, nobody is in a rush to get to the mountaintop. <laughs> oh, but here's what you can do. You can admire a person. You can offer moral support. You can pray for someone. You can show concern for your fellow man, and we can, should, and must make demands of Washington. Here's a speech you can remember. Perhaps the community you're in is not dealing with the same issue. I get it, maybe it's drugs. And like this woman, someone in your community is saying people just don't know, but it's really hard. Not only me, there's so much more that's in the same shape. I'm not the only one with a drug problem. Here's your response. I admire you. You have my moral support. I'm praying for you. I'll come back and see you and I will make demands for you. Or people just don't know. But it's really hard, not only for me, there's so many more that's in the same shape. I'm not the only one who can't afford to live here anymore because of gentrification. Here's your response. I admire you. You have my moral support. I'm praying for you. I'll come back and see you, and I will make demands for you. Or people just don't know. But it's really hard. Not only me, there's so much more that's in the same shape. I'm not the only one afraid of gang violence. And here's your response. Yep, you guessed it. I admire you. 
You have my moral support. I'm praying for you. I'll come back and see you and I will make demands for you. In every scenario, the same speech applies. This is the little black dress of speeches suitable for every occasion. Now, some might argue that this was more of a conversation than a speech, but it's been said that a great speech almost becomes a conversation. Initially, I considered his discourse a great sermon because ever the preacher, Dr. King, was able to provide a listening congregation with an introduction and at least three points. Nevertheless, in studying the components of a speech, you'll find that Dr. King delivers on them all. He begins with an introduction. You all are really to be admired. If the purpose of an introduction is to immediately capture your audience's attention and interest, then I believe Dr. King did just that. The fact that he took the time to make a stop in this small town demonstrates his respect and admiration for them, something he learned from Jesus, no doubt. Truly, we are fascinated by Jesus' steps, but have you ever considered his stops? Jesus was always willing to be stopped. He stopped during prayer. He stopped in the temple. He stopped while eating, while he even stopped dying on the cross long enough to care for the thief next to him. Being a leader means being stopped, and that's admiration. Dr. King was no stranger to admiration. The beauty here was his willingness to make time to admire someone in the world who was thought less than admirable. Imagine the Nobel Peace Prize winner addressing a mother of six and expressing his admiration for her. What does it do for the esteem of those we serve when we take a moment from our busy schedules and endless and often fruitless meetings to show our admiration? What does it mean to a first grader with a career who wants a career in law enforcement to go to get a school visit from the sheriff? What does that mean to that little child? What's that, what does it mean to constituents to see their elected officials engaging in community events when it's not an election year? What does it mean to a church member to see her pastor walk through the hospital room door or connect via Zoom regardless of her annual giving statement? What does it mean to be admired? Truly, this is what Dr. King meant by harnessing the drum major instinct, because let's face it, you can't be much of a drum major without a band. It's the band that gives the drum major purpose. Furthermore, Dr. King then continues his speech by citing his main points, moral support, prayer, continued care, and unity. Ever attuned to his audience, he knew that this was not the time for exaggerated rhetoric. They didn't need the doctor, they needed the reverend. And more than anything, they needed his moral support. He said, you have my moral support. When you give someone moral support, you encourage them in what they are doing by expressing approval. In other words, Dr. King was saying, I'm on your side, which means everything to someone who feels like the whole world is against them. Young and black Latinx children could use some moral support. Women of color in the workplace could use some moral support. Essential workers on the vanguard of this virus could sure enough use some moral support. We can't be everywhere. When physical support is not possible, when financial support is out of the question, sometimes a verbal endorsement will do the trick. Well, you gotta say is way to go. I got your back. I see you, sis. Hang on in there. Great job. Sometimes all it takes is a word to make someone feel safe and supported. Oh, but here's what I like. Nevertheless, King doesn't stop at moral support, but then offers spiritual support. And here we see King, the pastor. He spoke of prayer as the sacred heart of faith and the foundation of devotional life. Pastors and spiritual leaders, our job is to cover our flocks in prayer. We pray when no one else is praying. And in this case, we pray when you don't have the strength to. Perhaps this is what Pastor King saw as he looked into the sunken eyes of those in the room. He saw a weary and worn congregation who needed prayer now more than ever, 
whose hunger for food rivaled only that of their hunger and thirst for justice. Oh, when their feet got tired of marching and their throats became raw from chanting and when they had reached their physical limit, no doubt it helped to know that someone was praying for them. Perhaps they lacked the energy to pray and short of saying grace over a substantial meal, it's highly likely they didn't even want to pray. And here, King steps in as an intercessor, raising the prayers that they could not. Church, I want you to know that when your eyes are tired of crying, when your spirit is tired of quarantining and your hands are tired of sanitizing, when your family is tired of home working and schooling and as the death toll rises, your hearts are tired of grieving, I want you to know your pastor is praying for you. I thank God for those who stepped in and prayed for me. I am now standing here reaping the benefits. You are now sitting there reaping the benefits of your foremothers and your forefathers' prayers. They prayed for you. They prayed for me. When I didn't have sense and you didn't have sense enough to pray for yourself, I can hear the saints singing. Somebody prayed for me, had me on their mind, and took the time to pray for me. I ought to have a witness. I'm so glad they prayed. I'm so glad they prayed. I'm so glad they prayed for me. Oh, and if truth be told, our nation is still reaping the benefits of Dr. King's prayers. When our nation doesn't even have the sense to pray for itself, Dr. King prayed. He says, and in these days of emotional tension, when the problems of the world are gigantic in extent and chaotic in detail, give us penetrating vision, broad understanding, power of endurance and abiding faith and save us from within the paral paralysis of crippling fear. And oh God, we ask thee to help us work with renewed vigor for a warless world and for a brotherhood that transcends race or color. This prayer is even more relevant it now than it's ever was. And knowing that support and prayer are only half the battle, King promises, I'm coming back to see you. This, my brothers and sisters, is where we tend to fall short. <laughs> we often offer all the moral support in the world and we pray until our knees get raw. But unless we do something, it's all for naught. Sadly, if it were up to most of us, the speech would end right here. <laughs> but support without substance and sustainability is really no support at all, just as faith without works is dead. Because the work is just getting started. I got a carpenter spirit today. We've only just begun. They were on the road to Washington. They were on the road to speak truth to power. And perhaps from where you're sitting, Washington is too lofty a goal. Certainly, given the events of last week, it may even be ill-advised. And I can hear somebody saying, Reverend Williams, I'm just one person. I can't watch, watch March to Washington. Maybe you can't march to Washington. Oh, but here's what you can do. You can march to the school board. You can march to the PTA meeting. You can march to your local community meetings. And as we have proven for sure, that if we don't march anywhere else, we know we can march to the polls. We are going to be demanding when we go to Washington that something be done and done immediately about these conditions. Notice here how the speech moves from the singular I to the collective we. When we go to Washington, who was the we? It was all of them. This was a push for unity. Even Dr. King said, we must all learn to live together as brothers or we will all perish together as fools. We are tied together in the single garment of destiny, caught in an inescapable network of mutuality. And whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. For some strange reason, I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. This is the way God's universe is made. This is the way it is structured. We are tied together in the single garment of destiny. Well, Dr. King, you may be surprised to know that our garment has some holes in it. You see, it's sustained some wear and tear over the years. It's been moth-eaten by marginalization, 
worn out by war, ripped apart by racism, and some seem to say there's something wrong with its borders. It's been faded by fear, pulled apart by prejudice, and the design has been destroyed. And it seems that some would just have us go ahead and slap on an ill-fitting patch. But I say grab a needle and thread. Don't patch. It's time to mend. Because this is not a you thing. It's not an I thing. It's not a me thing, a he thing, or she thing, or an us thing. This is a we thing. I need you to survive. The church, you've heard the introduction, and I walked you through the main points, but there's a key component missing from this speech, and veritably the most vital component. The one element of this speech that Dr. King was unable to provide was the close. He was killed three weeks later and unable to fulfill the promises made to the audience that day. And I can't help but to think of the poor woman in that small church. What did she feel when she received the news of his murder? Did she give up on her dream of a life beyond poverty? I wonder as Langston Hughes, did her dream dry up in the Mississippi sun? You see, Dr. King couldn't fulfill his promise, but you can. You see, it's up to all of us to deliver the conclusion that Dr. King could not. It's up to you to bring the King's speech to a close. Oh, if the purpose of a close or conclusion is to leave a lasting impression and reclaim the essence of the speech, then each one of us has a responsibility to continue the work that Dr. King started. It's time for us to reclaim the essence of this speech. It's not enough to sing songs. It's not enough to gather virtually in his honor. It's not enough for you to have the day off if you really want to honor Dr. King, put feet to faith and finish the speech. How do you finished the speech as Stacey Abrams. She finished the speech by rallying voters and turning a red state blue. How do you finish the speech? Asked Raphael Warnock. He finished the speech by becoming the first black person ever elected to the U.S. Senate from the state of Georgia. How do you finish the speech? Go ahead and ask Kamala Harris. She finished, she finished the speech on Wednesday when she sworn in as the first woman and woman of color to serve as the vice president of the United States of America. America. You have the power, church, to finish the speech. There is more for us to write. You have a responsibility to finish the king's speech. How do you finish the speech? Clothe the people he couldn't clothe. Feed the people he could not feed. Visit the folks that he could not visit. Be a voice to the voiceless and pray for those who cannot pray. Finish the speech by ensuring that the words inscribed at the base of the Statue of Liberty will truly ring true. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. The wretched refuse of your teeming shore, send these, the homeless tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Make sure that comes true. That's how we close the speech. And now, because I'm a Baptist preacher, I gotta close the speech the only way I know how. You see, Dr. Dyson said that the goal for his book was to resurrect a king in whom humanity and greatness live side by side. And I know he meant Dr. King, but I know another king in whom humanity and greatness did live side by side. Dr. King couldn't keep his promise after his death, but I know another king who three days after his death proved faithful to keep his promise to rise from the grave. I know another king who gives moral support. Lo, I am with you always. I know another king who prays for you. He's intercessing for you right now. I know another king who's gone to prepare a place for you and is coming back. I know another king who is making demands of the Father on your behalf right now. I know another king who loves you. I know another king who is protecting you. I know another king who is keeping you. I know another king that's making ways for you. I know another king that's opening doors for you. I know another king that's wrapping his loving arms around you today. I just I want you to know that you have a king, a king who died for you, who gave his life for you, and even right now desires to be in fellowship with you. Some of you have been walking alone for a very long time, 
but there is a king who admires you, who wants to give you moral support, who is praying for you, who does come to see about you and is making demands of the Father on your behalf. Thank you so much for being with us today. I love you. Jesus loves you. God bless you. The doors of the church are open, albeit virtually. I know I say that every week. I'm so grateful that you guys tune in regularly and faithfully with us. Your support does not go unnoticed. But there is a king who wants to support you. Some of you have been walking this road alone. I imagine sometimes that's probably how Dr. King felt. Ministry is a lonely business. Leadership is a lonely business. But I know he knew that the Lord was by his side every step of the way. And I want you to know the same. You see, your speech is not concluded either. There's still more writing <laughs> to be done in your life. And I pray that one of the things written is your name in the book of life. And how do we do that? by connecting with Jesus Christ. There's information at the bottom of the screen. If you want to give your life to Christ today, you have an open and welcome invitation to do that. Call us, email us, reach out to us, connect with us as we work to connect you with Christ. And maybe you've already given your heart to the Lord and you find yourself in a difficult season. Will you connect with us so that we might pray for you? We have a team here who wants to pray for you and encourage you. We want to be that moral support for you. Will you give us the opportunity to get to know you and you us? Or maybe you just have questions. You know, this, this Christian walk, you know, Jesus that you talk about, I, I never heard a lot. I don't read the Bible. We're here to answer your questions. Just reach out to us. All of the numbers, all the information is at the bottom of your screen. And there's another way that you can connect with us as well. We call it worship and giving. We're asking you to partner with us. While we know that we are still very much in the throes of this COVID-19 crisis, the work of our church and the work of this community still continues. And we can't do it without you. We know that we're not in a church building and maybe, that, maybe it feels to you like, you know, you can't give or you don't know how. There are several ways <laughs> For you to give. You can give via Givelify. Go to the Givelify app and look for the First Baptist Church of Bridgehampton. You can go to Cash App, dollar sign Bridge Nation. You can also give what some might call the old fashioned way, still works for me, mailing your tithes and offerings to P.O. Box 927, Bridgehampton, New York 11932. Or if you are still concerned about having to go out or doing things digitally, please give us a call, connect with us again. And one of our leaders, our financial leaders, our leaders here in the church can make arrangements to pick up your offering. But we wanna partner with you. We have some great initiatives coming up and we need people like you to help us be the hands and feet, the arms and legs of Jesus Christ here on earth. As I said last week, we see people in, in conditions, we see people struggling, and we often wonder, why doesn't God do something about that? God did. God made you. So again, will you partner with us in giving, partner with us in worship, partner with us in prayer, partner with us as your church family? We are the First Baptist Church of Bridgehampton, connecting directing, and protecting. And we love you. See you next week.